So I don't have any slides, and I don't know if you're going to miss them, but um, I'm not. And so um, I'll first tell you a little bit about what I do, um, and then I'll tell you some things that I think would be interesting to you about what I've done, and then I'll talk about what I'm doing right now, because all of them are kind of related. And so basically, I'm a psychologist, but nice otherwise. I work in a group of social scientists, designers, and technology people at Intel Labs, which is the R&D division for Intel. I've been there for 23 years. I went there in 96, moving from Chicago, actually. And uh, where well, they told me it rained in the winter, and I said that sounded like heaven. <laughs> um, so I uh, moved there, and I thought, I'm going to stay for five years because I realized I could double my salary by going to industry. And it was like, and, and the thing is, it was like working with really smart people. And I think that, you know, that's, I'm sure that's why everybody's here, right? It's like you want to work with smart people. It's really important. And I'm going to tell you that I do a lot of different things, and I can do a lot of different things because I work with a bunch of smart people. And um, so I've done a lot of work in artificial intelligence. I do work in ethics. I do work in education, I do work in development, I do work in autonomous vehicles, I do work in um, smart cities. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. So um, when I started the smart city stuff, it actually started because I was doing smart agriculture. And to be perfectly honest, the reason that I did smart agriculture is because my boss said, I really want you to work with some of the young people. And I said, yeah, I, I, I don't really want to. <laughs> and he said, no, you know, we really, we really want you to work with some of the young people, sort of show them how to go out and do field work and, you know, work with tech people to use that field work. I said, yeah, I really don't want to. And he said, well, you can work in vineyards. I said, oh, I actually have some ideas for where we could go. And so we did a bunch of work. We actually deployed the first, actually, major um, wireless network, you know, wireless sensor network in the wild. We did it in about 2000. And we thought that there were a bunch of them out there because everybody was talking about wireless sensor networks and how wireless sensors and networks of sensors around communities were going to make a difference. And we thought, well, there's got to be a million of them. It was really, really hard to do. But like I said, I work with smart people. And we put out a, a mesh network of 64 sensors in a vineyard. And we showed that intracite variation affected fruit quality. And you know, for the one, on the one hand, you know, it's fun to do. On the other, it actually wound up making a difference. We were able to look at sort of what kinds of, what kind of prices were there, what kind of you're like, when you want to do something like that, what do you have to pay for? What do you have to do? How much work is there? What kind of returns can a farmer imagine getting from doing this? What's the business case look like? So we did all of those things from our one adventure, drinking a lot of wine. So it was pretty good. Um, and the smart city stuff kind of came out of that because all of a sudden, these cities want to start putting out lots of wireless sensor networks. And we were interested in seeing, well, what do they have to do? How's it mu how much is it going to cost? How are they going to get returns on it? What kind of services do they want? And so I've done work, really, in cities all around the world now. I want to tell you about three that I did, because these three things, I think, might change your mind about some of the things that happen in smart cities, or some of the things that you might want to make happen in smart cities or more to the point, things that you might not want to make happen in smart cities. And it starts off thinking about open data. And I went into it as a very strong open data advocate. I thought, you know, sunshine, it's the best disinfectant. We did some work in uh, Peñuelo land in Chile, and, um, and they opened up their, their um, municipal data system, and it really helped people in underserved communities to better participate in the procurement process, 
distributing money bro more broadly in the community. It was really brilliant. It was great. Um, and that all came from making the data open. But I want to tell you about three projects that we did where making the data open was less than brilliant. Um, one of them was in Tasmania. Now, people might know that in Tasmania, they have a, um, you know, or in Australia more generally, there's been um, terrible, terrible droughts. At the end of the last one, uh, the central government in Canberra, which is sort of the center of Australia, well, it's, it's, it's not on the coast. Um, in Canberra, they wanted to regulate the water use by these farmers in a river valley in northeastern Tasmania. There was one sensor that was put on one side of a mountain range. The river valley is on the other side of the mountain range. And what they wound up doing was they, said, they told these farmers, OK, we're going to regulate your water use. You know, Farmer Jones, you need to take your water from this creek. And Farmer Jones said, you know, I've been farming this land for 50 years, and I've never seen water there. That's a dry creek bed. I can't pull my water from there. And the central government said, but our models say that there should be water there. So well, your models are based on a sensor that's over on the other side of the mountain, on the rainy side of the mountain. And we're on the dry side. He said, look, why don't we put out a whole bunch of sensors throughout this valley, and what we'll do is we'll show you that we're good stewards. And the, the problem was that at the bottom of this river valley, there was an estuary that they wanted to protect. And they said, we can protect the estuary with our normal cultural practices. And the central government said, well, all right, fine. And they put out all these sensors. They collected all this data. They showed that they were good, they were good stewards. They actually did make sure that the estuary stayed wet while they also got enough water for their farms. And for three years, the government said, oh, you know, that's great. And if the story ended there, it would have been a happy ending. But what happened was the government then said, you know what? We want to, um, we want to regulate your water now because now we have enough data to show how much water there is. And the farmers are like, no, come on. We showed you. Let us do it ourselves. And the government said, no, you know, we're going to do it. And the farmers said, we're going to take back our sensors. And the government said, well, we can put out our own sensors. And the farmers said, how are you going to make sure that they don't get sabotaged? <laughs> <laughs> and the government said, oh, all right. <laughs> all right, for now. And so right now, they're unregulated. They're showing that they're good stewards. There's actually, um, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in economics for showing ways that the commons could be managed by people who live in the commons. And that's what we're talking about here, right? Is that this is data about the commons. And when we think about a data commons, do we think about it being restricted to the people in the community to use? Or do we think about it being for everyone? Because if it's for everyone, then the central government might say, I want to use it for this. Second example, you know what, I think just because of time, I'll only give you two. So the second example is actually here, right outside Chicago. I was working with the Center for Neighborhood Technologies here in, in Chicago. And they were working with Midlothian. And Midlothian wound up getting this terrible, terrible problem with flooding. And the, they just kept on flooding. And the people who were flooded went to the mayor's office and said, we've got a terrible problem with flooding. So, well, you know, that's your house. Don't come and bother us about your house. So, no, it's not our house. There's like a big community of people who are all being flooded. Well, nobody's talked to us about it. So this one woman went around and talked to all her neighbors and then started collecting data about the floods. And then the city said, OK, all right, you flood. All right, you got us. But it's because of changes in the climate. There's nothing we can do about it. There are more microbursts, and it's dumping more water into the, into the watershed. And they said, you know, wouldn't we see the rain? We're only the second town in the watershed. 
there's not more water. It's upstream people changed the infrastructure around the creek, and now it's filling up more quickly. And they said, that's not what's happening. So they went out and they collected more data. They actually developed a model showing what happened. They wound up getting everything turned around. It's, they don't flood anymore. But what happened was, in the meantime, they had contacted FEMA to see if they could get money. And FEMA said, you know what, we don't really do that. You don't have the right kind of emergency for us. And then it wound up that um, FEMA came back to them afterwards and said, hey, you know that data you were talking about? We want that data because we're going to redraw the flood boundaries and say that you're in a flood zone. So no, we fixed it. If you do that, people who buy property here are going to have to pay flood insurance. It's going to add 200 to 500 dollars a month in payments for the total cost of ownership of land here in town. It's going to reduce the value of everything. We fixed the problem. And FEMA said, well, you know, actually our criteria for establishing flood zones really simply say that if it's flood, flooded so many times in the past few years, then you get this designation. They're like, we fixed it. I said, no, come on, give us the data. I said, no, I'm not giving you the data, and they never did. And FEMA hasn't redrawn the boundaries. But again, it's data about the commons, right? Most people would say that the watershed is the commons. And it's the community, it's an impact on the community. And one of the things that's interesting here, and um, without going too much into it, I'll say that one of the things that's interesting is that you actually need people from the commons in order to make sense of data from the censors. They're the ones that know what those data mean. You can't just look at sensor data and say, oh, okay, I know what's going on. You need what, um, what sometimes people call situated knowledge. It, for people who are interested, who know like Lucy Suchman's work and plans and situated actions. It's like you need to have that sort of situated understanding of what's going on in order to do anything. And that includes interpreting data coming off sensors. And so when we look at municipal data, the interpretation of that data is really only possible with the knowledge and cooperation of the people who live in those communities, which actually gets back to the ways in which Eleanor Ostrin talked about how the commons can be managed. You know, a lot of neoliberals have argued around this idea that, um, that you know, we've, we've got the tragedy of the commons, the only thing we can do is enclosure, and you know, taking property and making it private so a private person can do it, or the government has full control over the use of it. And the truth is that people who live in communities are the best stewards of the information about their communities. And so, that, with that as background, what I'm doing right now is um, you all are um, embarking on your Array of Things project. Um, smart city sensors from, you know, designed by folks out at Argonne with some cooperation from University of Chicago, have put up now 105 sensors around Chicago. It's planned to have another 100 so before the end of the summer. Uh, they want to have 1,500 ultimately. And what they want to be able to do is to take these sensors and use it to do something useful. Now, normally, so I'm, so at Intel, I'm considered, I'm a psychologist, but they, I, for some reason, they insist that I'm an ethnographer. And I say, no, 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 that's a special thing. It's like, but, but I'm a qualitative researcher. I do research on communities and people within them. And, um, and normally what I like to do is I like to do um, research trying to figure out what do people want to do and then develop the technology to support that rather than deploy the technology and say, now what can we do with this? And so um, I'm super interested in the array of things which is going up without service delivery or, or service development already done. And they're doing some work down in um, Englewood, where they want to use the array of things for doing economic development in the community, from basically from the um, 
you know, from, if people know Englewood, oh no, actually, better yet, if people know South Park, um, the, in South Park they had a number of shows where they talked about putting in a um, Whole Foods in order to change the tenor of the community. They did that in Englewood. And so from the Whole Foods, across maybe, I don't know, half a mile, this is an area that they want to fix up and do a lot with, and we'd like to help them do it. And we want to try to figure out, well, what kinds of services do they need in order to actually get the results that they want to get? So that's why I'm here. But I'm also here because we're working with the city of Oakland, looking at um, how to help cities um, adopt surveillance technologies. And when we call them surveillance technologies, people are often, they think, oh yeah, that's what they are. But I can promise you that cities do not think that. Cities do not think a license plate reader is a surveillance technology. But um, the easiest thing to do is, for people who know sort of threat models, the easiest thing to do is to present a threat model for license plate readers. License plate readers look at a car, they see what the license plate is, see what kind of car it is, they see what the location is, and they keep a record of it. So they can figure out, well, this car has been in this location every day, and let's say that the car is parked near a mosque. And we make data open, and we can figure out every car that's been parked near a mosque regularly, and we can figure out who goes to the mosque. We can figure out who goes to the bar. We can figure out who hangs out with whom. And those kinds of things, I think, sit very easily under the category of, of, um, of surveillance technology. And so what we're interested in is how do we help cities to understand exactly what it is that people can do with these technologies that they want to put in place, and how can we help them to deliver the services that they want while protecting the, the citizens in the way that they must. And I think that, am I done? I can keep on going, but I actually, so I just talk. I was like, I'm sorry, I just, I just keep going. But I, I'm thinking that was about 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. any questions? All right. Hello there, um, I, I have a question. Uh, I thought the things that you said were very interesting in the beginning about agriculture. Um, I, I grew up on a, a farm and have a, a long history of uh, family and agriculture. And um, my dad, he, oh, he's retired now, but he used to put rain gauges on the corners of every acre of his uh, uh, farm. And he'd drive around and see, you know, how much rain each uh, little plot of land received. And, and um, I guess there are tools now that will take care of that for you. Um, but I really think there's something about my dad driving around and seeing it for himself. And I see so many of these little, you know, gadgets and ag tech and this, this and that and the other thing that say that we will take care of all this for you, we will take the guesswork out of farming for you. And I just don't buy it because I think that these two words that you mentioned, um, situated knowledge, is there's still something very important about that. And uh, I just uh, really appreciate um, what you said there, and I thought uh, you might have a few more comments about it. Yeah, um, Yeah. so absolutely, I totally agree with you. Um, one of the problems that people often have is that they think that they can look at this measurement and they can use the measurement. One of the things that we did was we, um, we were measuring temperature variation at a really small scale when we looked at the wine grapes. And I have to admit, we've done a bunch of stuff since, and I just. I'm going to ignore it all. Um, because the wine grapes are actually pretty interesting. We've had 64 sensors in one hectare. So 2.2 acres, more or less, with 64 temperature sensors. You cannot manage your farm at that scale. You just can't. And um, you know, as a matter of, you know, when you're picking grapes, you pick a row of grapes. And when you, you, know, ferment, you put the grapes into a fermenter, you have to put the right amount of grapes into that fermenter. You don't really have a choice of taking out these and just doing them separately. That's not the way it works. And so um, there is a problem of like really trying to understand the cultural practices that farmers have, the extent to which we can really help. 
Um, and then also, like, what the farmers want to do. I can remember one of the, one of the vineyards that we worked with, uh, the farmer said, you know, no matter what you give me, I'm walking the farm every day. And, you know, if you can give me something that's going to help me doing that, that's fine. But don't think you can replace it because nothing you can tell me will replace what, what I see. And it's true. I mean, the thing is that they were doing things like looking at, you know, this flower is blooming. That means that this bug is going to be coming out. And, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to put out when, when does that particular flower bloom sensors? Because there's a lot of things that they get. There's lots of input that farmers get when they're out there in the field. And we're never going to be able to replace it. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. But that said, I think that it's an interesting tool and it can actually raise the value of the crop, which is what we were really trying to do, is to figure out what can we do that will make a buyer spend more money on the produce. Um, hi, um, uh, could you talk a little bit more about error of things and like what is the process of deploying these sensors? Um, because you mentioned that you're interested in understanding what the um, like the city wants before deploying a technology, but like where you deploy and that question, uh, like how do you decide and how much of that is with in consultation with the people in the ground? Yeah, so I'm not, um, you know, I talk to the Array of Things people, but I am not part of the Array of Things project. So I can't tell you a lot. What I can tell you is that the sensors have been put in various places around the city um, because of um, um, a really cute thing that they do in Chicago called ad aldermanic prerogative. Um, it winds up going in places where aldermen want to see something that shows that they've got, you know, that they're making their ward smart, um, which is not the way that a data scientist would put out a sensor. Um, I do know that they've been responsive to the community. So, for example, they had a, um, they had a Bluetooth sensor on it. So I don't know if people know that Bluetooth is what's called a promiscuous radio system, so it's constantly broadcasting its ID. And so if you put a reader out, you can actually see which Bluetooth IDs are passing by the reader. So they were saying, we can put, you know, a thousand of these or a hundred of these in the loop, and then we can uh, figure out what path people are taking. We have ant trails of all of, the, all of the Bluetooth radios. And it's OK, because we're just going to know the radios. We're not going to know the people. But of course, we do have cameras facing down that could ultimately be used to figure out like, who the people were by looking at who's the same, you know, it's the same person with the same Bluetooth ID. And yeah, so of course, we could figure that out. But you know, we wouldn't do that. Um, and people in Chicago freaked out. They took out the Bluetooth reader. But they left in the cameras. There's a downward-facing camera and an upward-facing camera. There's air quality measurements. There's, um, there's uh, like temperature, humidity, those sorts of things. There's um, a microphone. Uh, not the, it's not set up the way that you would set up for um, you know, a shot finder. It's not that kind of thing. Um, but like I said, I don't think that service de development has been a big part of it. It's mostly just this is a badge that shows that we're a smart city. And, um, and that's probably, and I don't mean that to be negative. It just is. <laughs> that's probably, I should, probably shouldn't say that, but there you go. So um, I guess the nature of this array of things is that some big organization like a city government or a corporation or somebody owns it? How would you, in, how would you envision this as a more commons-based approach with the uh, with the people in neighborhoods actually doing it? I mean, I think that um, I think that in order to really do a reasonable deployment, that um, data scientists need to be involved to make sure that the data are doing the right thing. In order to, uh, to do the right thing, I think that ethicists and 
um, somebody who's going to be able to do some kind of requirements gathering, to, to use the old school tech term, you know, like figuring out what communities really want. They need to be involved. They don't need to be members of the community, but the community needs to have oversight of everything. And, you know, Chicago is weird. I mean, y'all know that. And I don't mean, I mean it in a loving way. Um, but, you know, wards are not communities. And so, like, Englewood actually, I think, cuts across a few different wards. It's mostly the 20th, um, but it's a bunch of different wards. And so, an alderman shouldn't be deciding what, what Englewood gets. Englewood residents should be deciding what Englewood gets. So, I don't know. Um, I think that, um, but I do know that I believe communities should be able to veto any sharing of their data, and the first, the first inclination should be keep it close. Um, when you described your first two examples, it made me think of uh, David Orr, uh, who's a biologist who has a concept called slow knowledge and fast knowledge, not to be confused with Kahneman's slow and fast thinking, but basically that intuitive wisdom of folks who have been in a place for a long time can outpace things like sensor data um, wrongly interpreted. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you think that open has become a dogma and um, kind of relatedly, do you think there are good um, framings for how to consider when open might be useful or when it might be more hazardous? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a really great question and that's what people always say when they don't have an answer. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things is that absolutely, I mean, like I said, I started off thinking, you know, everything open all the time and then close it when something bad happens. But really bad things happen. And I don't think that anymore. But I still think that there's a ton of things that, re value that comes like we saw in Penula Len, you know, it's like, that was so valuable, and no one, I mean, it was a procurement for the administration. It's like, why shouldn't that be open? You know, it just seems like that should be open. But it also seems like, you know, air quality data should be open. But if it really, if you need to be a local in order to understand what's going on with air quality, making it open, like letting Zillow read air quality for a community where everyone who lives there knows that the factory closed last week, that's a different kind of a thing. I mean, Zillow shouldn't be using that. And I think that, um, yeah, I, you know, I wish I knew, and I wish that there was a really, we don't really get a lot of people from on the city side. And this is, you know, everything's being controlled in the cities. So we don't get a lot of people on the city side asking us to help them work through that. And because of that, we don't get to do much. So I just don't know. I know it's a problem, and I know it needs a resolution, and I would encourage you to do it. <laughs> um, I would say, one more thing I will say, which is kind of interesting, and the, the, the person who talked about AI and ethics, I think this fellow right here is looking down. Um, he, uh, you know, AI and, so there's a long history of people doing sort of um, technology and ethics, and um, my favorite example is, um, the geek's geek, the nerd's nerd, the guy with the name Norbert Wiener. How could you, I mean, and Norbert Wiener is a god. Norbert, I mean, honestly, honestly. Um, he was the father of cybernetics, and he, um, he worked on the bomb in the 40s, and by the end of the 40s said, my god, what have we wrought? And he spent a lot of the rest of his career talking about what are the problems we encounter with technology. And one of the things that your question reminded me of was um, Wiener talked about the speed with which machines can do things far outstripping what it is that people can do. The, like our ability to control machines. I mean, we need them to slow the fuck down. You know, it's like they're too fast, they do too much. And there's a lot of things that we really don't want to have happen. And so the, um, you know, one of the things recently there was, you know, Baxter, the, the robot that I think Baxter just died. But, um, 
before Baxter was dead, somebody put one of those um, helmets that gets your sort of EEG and looks for error signals, and they said, look, we can actually use the error signals from the brain. Somebody doesn't even have to tell the machine to, so, that it made a mistake because it can see from looking at somebody's brain that it made a mistake. And the speed that they could do that with, right, so it's like not pushing a button, it's just your brain, 15 orders of magnitude slower, the brain is 15 orders of magnitude slower than the machine in doing something. So that doesn't help. The machine just needs to slow down. They, we can't let our machines do things that are gonna hurt, that are gonna hurt us. And that's sort of the most important thing. And I think like when we're making a decision about what we can deploy, we need to first say, how could this hurt us? And then say, all right, if it can't hurt us, now let's think about how we could do it. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm, uh, I've been interested in smart cities for, for a number of years, and, and I'm kind of working through some uh, concepts for a startup idea, uh, and one of which is, would be a service that sort of replaces an existing manual service um, that a city normally performs. Could you speak to any points on approaching a city or a community um, in informing them, like, hey, you, you really need this service, or I can improve this service? You know, how to get them to, to buy into that or to at least give you a second look when you're trying to sell some of these smart city ideas? Yeah. So I think for the first 10 years or so, smart cities were almost entirely doing things looking at, um, looking at, how do we actually make it easier for smart cities to provide, to deliver a service that they've always delivered? Whether it's doing things like helping out the, the people in the water bureau to do a better job of managing the wastewater, or you know, helping cops know, you know where to go for this, that, or the other thing. You know, understanding how you know, all of these things that cities already do could be done better. You know, we're doing stuff with um, changing the way traffic lights work to improve um, air quality. Uh, you know, so that there's lots of things like that that cities have always done, but now cities are realizing that when communities make these big investments, they often also want to be able to prove that this is improving the quality of life for their, for their citizens in addition to improving the quality of the the sort of the quality of life for their employees. And so I think that, you know, showing the way that you bridge that is really important. And it could just be, we're going to save you boatloads of money. Um, let's hope it's not by putting people out of work, but, um, you know, that sort of thing. I don't know. Well, thanks.